This presentation is brought to you by the International Sportsmen's Exposition, the West's largest fishing, hunting, camping, and outdoor sports show, celebrating its 31st season. And by Ultimate Bass Radio with Kent Brown, Sports 1140 AM KHTK. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to International Sportsman's Expo. Our 30th uh, anniversary here in San Mateo, our 30th show here. We, uh, we've got a lot of great things going on. Seven different halls, full of display, full of uh, great things going on. The Redwood Hall has a youth outdoor affair. Bill Carr does an awesome job of that uh, over there for the kids. So if you have your kids with you, make sure you sit by and visit with Bill and all the, all the uh, great displays in the youth outdoor affair. We've got a lot of other stuff going on as well, but right now at the Ultimate Bass Aquarium Demonstration Tank, We've got one of the top speakers around, uh, one of the top fishermen around, and uh, we're also happy to have him in town. My name is Kim Brown, I'm the host of Ultimate Bass. We do an all-bass fishing radio show every Saturday morning on KHK in Sacramento, 11.40 a.m. It's on at 5 a.m. Uh, we've only got to to wake that early one time, and that's because he owed me. But uh, we, will, uh, we will have all the shows archived on westernbass.com as well. So if you want to check it on our Western Bass radio pages, you can uh, listen there. The guy up there on the tank, if you ever stopped out to a pro shop, the Rotor Park, you probably saw him behind the uh, counter for years. He was the manager there at Outdoor Pro Shop. Uh, until he went on the road and uh, did, a little, uh, did a little tour back east fishing the ASS. You guys saw him, the first fast practice classic he made, he danced. And he made a pretty good day for himself. The next year he danced again. Last year he had white hair. <laughs> now he's doing naked commercials for black. Hey, hey, he ain't got three nose yet. There's women and children in the house. Ah, now he's doing that. You're soon going to see him in a commercial on the Super Bowl this year. Uh, during the Super Bowl. So probably the first bass fisherman to ever do that. But more importantly, other than his marketability, he's a great fisherman. He's a seven-time Bass Master Classic qualifier. He'll be competing in Coho uh, when they resume in February. Next year on the BASS circuit, he'll be piloting one of the lucky craft boats, the new champion boat that he's designed for champion. Uh, we're happy to have him back in San Mateo. Just a side note, guys, he has not been back to the San Mateo show since he met his wife here. Wow. He's got a great claim to fame, met his wife at a sports show. Are you guys throwing that one out? Yep, one more thing Steve's done that you guys haven't done. Please, please welcome Champion Bo, Lucky Craft Lure Pro, uh, one of the top fishermen in the country. We're awful happy to have him here. Um, the blonde headed wonder from Auburn, California. Please welcome Steve Reed. Did I hear booing? Who's yeah. booing back there? Do you want to tell a story about Steve Nicky Tim in your booth? And by the way, you talk a lot. Oh, no, 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 do not give this man, if you had longer gray hair, you would pass for Santa Claus, you know that? I, I don't even have hair, dude. Let I, me, I, 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 come, I, come on, Seth. It wouldn't let me in on the round table, because I am a professional basket man, after all. I bought one that day with you. How do you get him? I produce a bass radio show, which means the host does, and she suggests quite often. About how many years ago was it? Ten years ago, maybe? No. Nah. How many years was Seven it? Years Seven Seven years ago. Eight years ago. Eight years ago. I was in the same setup over here. Had this wonderful little brunette working in the booth. Her name was Tim. This kid was just saying, I think I'm going to start being a pro here for these things. I'm going to work hard. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really give it an effort. He was doing a little Mickey Mouse seminars over here at the corner booth. He was getting pretty good at it. We thought, well, maybe he has a chance. He's got the look. He's got the weird-looking hair and stuff. Talking about weird-looking hair. What hair? But he would not leave my door. So I said, Steve, come here. This is Tim. Tim, this is Steve. Now, Steve, get out of my booth, and here's where he is today. You owe him still I'm going to have to live that one forever. Yeah. I, Those of you who don't know, that's Sap. His wife, Marilyn, up here from Sap's Tackle. They make little lures that they use to catch bass bait. They're called trout. So they make a lot of really cool stuff for catching bass bait. It's not legal bass bait, but it works great. And actually, that is a true story. I mean, why do we have to get into my family history up here, my life story and all that? Aw, you guys are so cute together. And I actually, I did. I met my wife at this show. And uh, I was doing tank demonstrations. Yeah, I saw it good looking Craig gal walked by and I was single and of course I chased anything and so I chased her over to Seth's booth and uh, lo and behold I, I gotta go back <coughs> her dad was here also and he's a big fisherman 
Uh, he was one of them, you know, weird kokanee trout trollers also, like Seth is. And they were, uh, you know, in the booth talking. So when he found out that I was a fisherman, he got all excited. So he encouraged his daughter to date me. Well, it took three months to get my first date with her. And our first date was fishing at Lake Sonoma. And oh, a little after that, we got married. And now I got one little girl and I got another one on the way. So or, uh, San Mateo has been pretty good to me, I guess. No complaints. So Seth, for the hundred times, thank you for my wife. All right, well, what are we doing? Everybody, come on down. There's plenty of seats over here. If anybody's tired, lazy, drinking beer. Hey, you got a two-fist of beer drinker. You can't drink two. You got to share one. All right. Um, what are we going to talk about up here today? Who knows? Um, we'll wing it. Now, we'll throw some stuff in there. And it's kind of cool coming back to, to San Mateo, and much less being in Northern California. Um, those of you that don't know who I am or what I do, is yeah, I get uh, I'm a professional bass fisherman, which means I chase these little green fish around the country and get paid to do it. Tough job, right? Somebody's got to do it. It might as well be me. And uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, I think most people think it's you know always a glamorous life of just being able to fish or whatever. Well, they don't realize all the other work that goes into it, from sponsor relationships uh, to media relations and. Uh, product development, um, and much less trying to take care of a family, which is quite important to me. Uh, but nevertheless, I get to travel around the country and catch a lot of fish. And to be honest with you, I started doing trade shows, specifically ISE shows, when I was 16 years old. Good God, that makes me... That was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I did my first trade show ever, and it was in San Mateo. And I got up, I was doing little casting demonstrations. How many of you remember Stan Fagerstrom? A few hands. Wow, there's a lot of people that don't know. So you have not been coming to the show for too long. Stan Fagerstrom was probably one of the world's greatest trick casters of all times. And he's probably about 130 now, but he can still put a little casting plug in a cup at 75 feet away, you know, between his legs, whatever. And he kind of helped me into getting into his booth and, and casting with him. And so from that point on, I wanted to get involved in the shows more, and, uh, and which I did. And for up until probably about the last, up until about five years ago, I still did a lot of trade shows. I probably did 20 to 50 days a year speaking at trade shows, such as this. And with my, the way my schedule is now, uh, with the tournament fishing and the televi television production standpoint, I probably only get to do maybe four or five of these a year. So if I'm a little rusty, don't blame me. <laughs> blame my schedule. So, But I still, I love being able to get up here and talk fishing and hang out with the fans and educate. Um, I talk a lot of smack. Those of you that do know me, um, you know that, those of you who don't know me, I'm always causing trouble. I'm always giving somebody a hard time, that's just me. I can, I can dish it out as good as I can take it, so if I talk a little smack about some guys up here, don't worry, I'm just, they're actually my friends. If I don't like you, I won't say anything about you at all. If I like you, I talk a lot of stuff, but from a fishing standpoint, I do not get to fish California as much as I used to. I grew up in Runner Park. Santa Rosa, Katati, uh, th those those are my stomping grounds. How many of you from Sacramento or uh, Runner Park, Santa Rosa? Well, I can see nobody up there likes to travel. <laughs> it's too rainy. Um, how many of you ever fished Spring Lake before? Yeah, we got a few hands. First bass I ever caught, eight years old, Spring Lake in Santa Rosa, California. And that from that day on, I was hooked. And I spent a lot of years, a lot of years, I mean, seven years fishing out of a float tube. And that's really how I truly learned how to bass fish, was in a float tube. How many of you own a float tube? A couple of you. How many of you own bass boats? Okay. What do the rest of you do? Fish from the bank? I don't know. Well, I'm telling you right now, if you want to get into bass fishing in a low budget situation, you want to learn it and have fun, take your kids fishing, and you can use it for trout fishing, you can use them in the rivers for steelhead fishing. But the new pontoon boats, the kick boats, there's one right over here leaning up against Fisherman's Warehouse. It is the most awesome way to learn how to fish. 
Um, number one is you fish a lot slower. Now, my problem is when I first got my first bass boat, I graduated from a pair of kick fins to 175 horsepower mercury. So I went from doing a quarter mile an hour to 74 miles an hour down across the lake. I didn't fish as much. But when I was fishing out my float tube, I, I learned how to fish efficiently down a shoreline, pick a part of cover, learn techniques, and do all that. And my catch rate was incredible. But like I said, when I got into my first bass boat, it literally took me about two to three years to settle down and put my hormones in check, you know, the testosterone in me, and think about fishing again. And once I did that, I actually started catching a bass again. So those of you that really want to get in it, that don't know a lot about it, I suggest low budget. Well, I suggest you go spend about $50,000 to go buy a brand new champion. That's what I'm supposed to tell you. But to start out, that's a great way for anybody to get started fishing. You want to get your kids into it. Um, so Northern California, that's where I'm from. Uh, I moved over to Auburn near Sacramento uh, five, six years ago, something like that. And with my schedule back east, fishing the tour, and like I said, the television events, I don't get the fish out here as much as I used to. Is my phone ringing? How many know who Marty Stone is? Marty Stone. Okay. Hey, Marty. I am standing on top of a hog trough doing a seminar to a few hundred people right now. Marty Stone from uh, North Carolina, our runner-up to Angler of the Year this past season, says hello to everybody. Okay. I know I was just stupid and forgot to turn my phone off. <laughs> so you get on a plane. See you, bud. <laughs> I'm sorry, but how many of you have ever watched Marty Stone? You saw him on Bass Tech with me last season, the television show we did for ESPN. I know a lot of people that are, what's the word, fastidious? He's beyond that. He is the most anal retentive person I know. I love him to death. He's like a brother to me. But I have never met anybody that has to have everything so perfect. And I just want to say, Marty, let it go. But he is a great fisherman, a great friend. You know what? I can talk all day about nothing up here. Let's talk about some fishing stuff. Because. Some of you probably want to hear something about fishing. Some probably don't even care. How many of you are just sitting down to rest your feet? How are your feet? Are you, are you, are you relaxing now? The, the hat looks good on you, by the way. Yeah, sure. All right, well, do you, do you fish at all? All right, good answer. All right, actually what I want to do is I want to go over some new products with you guys. And I'll explain to you why, where, when, how. Now where do we start? Being from California, I grew up fishing a lot of finesse fishing, the drop shotting when it became popular, the dark headed worms, and all the hand poured worms. Um, and I've been a die hard hand poured fisherman, oh, probably for the last 15 years or so. And I gotta tell you about a little story, this happened to me last year. One of my sponsors, Berkeley, Pure Fishing, they manufacture oh, a whole lot of stuff from soft plastics to gold to hard baits, anything, and the biggest producer of fishing line. So I had to go up there for do a little meeting, meet all the, you know, the big wigs and, you know, shake hands, meet and greet everybody. Well, one of my chores was to go spend half the day on the water with my boss from Pure Fishing. And his challenge to me was to go drop shotting on the lake there, Spirit Lake, and I got to fish any of my hand poured worms that I had from California, anything I wanted, and I had to go heads up against his worm, the gulp. How many of you ever heard of gulp? A lot of you. I'm telling you right now, it is the ugliest, stinkiest, nastiest stuff you'll ever smell and see and feel. It's horrible. If you pull some of the baits out of the package, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. They look like a crackhead. They're all, you know, the, the legs are all bent, going different directions. They don't work. If you try and reel a lizard through the water, nothing's moving. It's just, uh, not like a worm's supposed to look. So I said, well, this, is, this isn't fair. I'm gonna take you out. Well, 
That didn't happen. And for the first time, because for the last couple of years, they've, they've been pushing golf, trying to get it out there. I'm telling these guys, I absolutely will not fish that stuff. It looks horrible. It smells horrible. How can I have confidence in it? We went on that lake and we fished for three hours. I ran the front of the boat. I got to fish where I wanted to fish, cast where I wanted to cast. And I had my robo worms. I had my California worms. I had all my cool stuff. And he spanked me. It wasn't even close. And he's got this ugly, goofy gulf worm, and we're both drop shot. And I'm telling you, right, and it's not like he's a master fisherman. If you watched him fish, I mean, you're thinking he's just an average Joe Blow. He's never going to make it on the tour. And I'm, back, I'm up there fishing, fishing. I'd catch one every 30 minutes. He'd be catching one every three minutes. And we'd, fit, we'd cast to the same rock pile. And I'm thinking, there is just no way this is possible. It's true. He absolutely crushed me. After three hours of competing head to head, I said, give me one of the worms. When I put that gulf worm on, I absolutely drilled him. I'm never one to put a hard sell on anybody. I hate sales pitches as much as anybody. How many of you hate getting cold calls at home, the sales calls at home? But I'm telling you right now, that day, that moment, I actually got converted to Berkeley Gulf. Now, there's not a lot of the baits right now that I'll fish. They're working on them to make them a lot better. But there's about three baits in the lineup right now that are unbelievable on how they catch fish. I left there. I drove up to Lake Erie, <laughs> Erie, Pennsylvania. Never been on that part of Lake Erie in my life. Had a couple days to kill. I heard it's a great fishery. Stayed in the lake and in his back bay, caught a bunch of largemouth. Decided, well, I'm just going to go drive out in the middle of Lake Erie. I ran out of the mouth, just drove up the shoreline about 10, 20 miles, found some little reefs underwater, started drop shot, throwing a drop shot out there with a robo worm. I got bit every so often. I put on that gulp worm, throw it out there, quack, quack, quack. I probably caught 50 smallmouth in about an hour. I'm thinking this there's just this is not possible. So I'm just telling you, these are my little testimonies, testimonials about that Berkeley Gulf worm. Like I said, I don't normally want to give you sales pitches. It is ugly as that stuff is, and I never wanted to talk about it. I have to. The number one worm they got in that lineup. It's called a gulp nightcrawler or a gulp wacky crawler. I've got a night crawler here. I'm telling you, they're rank. Do not, do not leave a bag open in your car. If your car, your wife's going to wonder something because, and do not leave them in your boat. Do not throw them anywhere with the package open. It's no different than, as far as the shape-wise, of any other soft plastic worm out there. The thing is about a gulp, there's no plastic. It's all organic, it's all natural. It's biodegradable, which biodegradable stuff has come out before, it didn't work. Somehow, I don't know what, they got a whole process. It's so secret, when I was up there, they wouldn't even show me how they did. They got to freeze it, they, they do all kinds of weird stuff to this. But the product itself, what you want right now, until they get the right baits out and they, they improve their molds, you got to make sure you got a straight tail bait, such as a night crawler or the wacky crawler or the noodle. Reason being, like I said, if it's supposed to have a curl tail, it might have a curl tail, but it will not wiggle because they're ugly. Now, fishing this gulp is my favorite way to fish. Um, a drop shot rig now and and really for a long time I rigged it Texas style nose hooked uh, where my worm was straight all the time now probably about three years ago a good friend of mine that lives up in Northern California next to me he uh, we went out on Folsom Lake and he's in the back of my boat and he's actually catching the heck out of him I can't get bit and what I found out is he's rigging his worm wacky style. How many of you know what wacky style is? A wacka 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 wacky! Well, um, 
I'm not saying all the time. That's the best situation. In open water, you can get away with it. If you're fishing around, um, you know, any grass, trees, whatever it might be, it's not gonna, not going to be a good way to go because it's going to hang up a lot more. But by wigging it, wigging it wacky style, yeah, we're wigging it, we're wigging it, rigging it wacky style. And you see, when I twist that, now if he does that again, am I allowed to catch fish on this tank? I agree. All right. Sometimes we uh, we get reprimanded for catching a fish on a tank. Um, but with that, are they looking at it? But with that worm rig, I'm going to have a hard time saying rig wacky style. You get a lot more movement out of the bait rig wacky style than you do when it's straight. If you got a rig just in the nose, like you would a regular worm, it, that worm is just going to flow straight at you. When it's rigged sideways and that bait moves, the arms, both ends of the worm, collapse together. You get a lot more movement out of it. That is hands down the best way to fish open water with a drop shot rig. Now, we're trained not to set the hook up here. Can you believe that? No, I just didn't know he had it. I'm being honest. <laughs> I can tell you all you I do is on there the whole time. All right, I'm getting one. I might get fired, but you know what? It's just a day job here anyways. I'm telling you, it's the goal. Okay, kids, don't try this at home. Oh, no. All right. He's calling somebody. Hey, he caught one on the tank. How many of you have never drop shot it before? A few hands. Cowboy hat, you're definitely not a bass fisherman, I can tell that. So, drop shotting is a glorified catfish rig, and I'm telling you that because it's a fact. All I'm doing is I've got a small little weight on the bottom. I'm fishing six pound vanish fluorocarbon, and I've got a little one number one hook tied up above my weight. The whole objective of this bait is you keep your bait suspended up off the bottom. Now, if you think about like a crawdad or something crawling around the water, it makes sense. They're gonna be crawling in the rocks, the mud, the dirt. If you think about a little fish, such as a bluegill, a crappie, a minnow, whatever it might be, they're not crawling on the bottom. So with the drop shot presentation, what we're doing is we're getting a much more natura, natural, realistic look from a bait suspended. It's more an eye view of the fish. And I think, I truly believe that's one of the reasons the drop shot works so good. Um, I'm all excited. I haven't caught a bass in a while, to be honest with you. So if I catch another one up here, this would be the best month I've had in two or three months. So, <laughs> um, But typically what you want to do with fish, fish in a drop shot is you're going to cast it out, throw it out to a point near a dock, anywhere you would, any type of plastic worm. Now, most people that ask about drop shot, especially back east, because all they've heard about is this deep water all this deep water fishing that we do vertically. Hey, does anybody want to come stand next to the tank? Hey, buddy, you might get wet down there. Oh, oh well, here comes the boss to get reprimanded. Um, where was I? I got too excited there. But a lot of people think drop shotting is strictly a vertical technique. And I think that is the most farce statement of drop shotting you can make. The majority of the guys that do well drop shotting are casting it out there, no different than you would a Carolina rig, a Texas rig worm, anything. And those of you that have never caught bass and you want to learn how to catch fish, you want to take your kids fishing, bar none, this is the most efficient way for these guys, any novice, to go out and learn how to catch fish on any given lake. So like I said, I want to talk about some of the new products that's coming out up here. The gold thing, I'm telling you, it stinks. It's ugly. They're working. Man. It, the colors don't match anything like you would ever throw from a typical California, you know, hand poured worm. But the bottom line is, when that worm gets down there and the 
it starts dispersing all this stinky, slimy, nasty smell in the water, fish eat it, as you can see. So, something to think, keep about, think about, keep in mind, gulp. Now, how many of you fish the Delta? Delta? Delta. We got a few. Okay. We're going to go complete opposite. And by the way, when I get done here, any of you are more than welcome to come up and we get into more detail about a technique, a rigging, anything. Like I said, I want to go over some new stuff with you guys. Now, here's one of my favorite ways to fish. Now, how many, there's a, some of you were here earlier. We did a little round table session. There's five of us sitting on a panel up here and, the, and everybody got to ask questions. And we had one of the godfathers of fishing, D. Thomas. Is D around here? You're here. Where are D? Oh, good. I can say a lot of bad about him. No, just kidding. D. Thomas is the one that pioneered the flipping technique. Those of you who don't know what flipping is, we're using a seven and a half to eight foot rod. I prefer an eight foot rod. It's all shallow water, what I call combat fishing. I'm not out on, you know, something you're going to typically do on Lake Shasta, Lake Oroville, Folsom. For around here, it's predominantly going to be Clear Lake and Delta. And for me growing up, and with Clear Lake being my favorite lake, Delta, or the Clear Lake, was where I really, truly learned how to flip. And along the year, over the years, there's been a lot of refinements. Technology's gotten better, rods got better, lines got better. And every so often, we kind of stumble into something. Now, the flipping technique, D. Thomas found it 90 some odd years ago. He's a godfather. I've been fortunate, I've made a lot of money over the years. But one of the cool things for me is because I travel around the country now and I get to fish a lot of different bodies of water and meet a lot of different people and learn a lot of new stuff, there is actually some cool things that, you know, somebody outside of California is created. And usually we're the ones that, from the fishing industry, we're the trendsetters. We've created flipping, drop shy. We've done so much for the industry. But I went down to Florida. In Florida, how many of you are fishing in Florida? Not many. Florida fishing sucks. I'm just telling you straight up. Everybody talks about it being so good. I think it's horrible. They've got some big fish. You can go catch them on shiners. But on a regular basis, Florida fish is pretty tough. But one of the things I learned about Florida is in the Florida strain largemouth, when a cold front hits, those bigger fish migrate into these shallow waters and get under this real thick, heavy cover. We call it, they call it mats. And some of it, it's, they're like floating dirt mounds of grass, anything. The gators, you know, make beds out of it. Well, these big fish get underneath these mats. And to go in there with a typical half ounce jig or three, you know, three eighths ounce worm weight, it was impossible. And these guys were, I found out, were fishing these ounce, ounce and a half, and two ounce weights. I'm thinking, you guys have lost your mind. Well, I lost my mind when I found out they're weighing in 20 and 30 pound bags, and I've got like four pounds. So what they're doing is they're getting these big heavy sinkers and these big heavy rods and punching through this real thick heavy cover. It's no secret, bass, a lot of times, if there's shallow heavy cover around, especially the bigger fish, they're gonna tend to, to migrate towards those areas. If you've got a whole, you know, a nice tule bed, bank, grass line in the delta, those bigger fish are gonna live somewhere in a little nook and cranny in there, and they're gonna move up and down with the tide. Clear Lake, same thing. Usually the biggest fish you're trying to catch on Clear Lake are so far back up underneath the dock, you can't hardly get a cast there. Well, the cool thing is, like I said, going back there, I learned about flipping heavy weights and heavy fishing heavy grass. How many of you know what hyacin is? A lot of you are like, I have no clue what you're talking about. That's fine, because you're going to learn. Hyacinth is basically it's a it's a aquatic vegetation. It flows. It grows on the grows on the surface. It's green. It's nasty. It's gnarly. And crawdads love to live under it. They live in the root systems of the hyacinth. Hydrilla itself. We got a lot of it. Hydrilla on the delta. Bass love the thickest, nastiest stuff you can get into. 
Well, now with these big sinkers, and there's a few guys that have found out about this in the last couple. I get to catch another one. I, I, I think this is a first. I've actually been told to catch a fish. All right. <laughs> Talk me into it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a tournament. All right, it's Bass Masters Classic. I catch a bluegill. Oh man! Oh, look at it. Is there any down here? I can't see with all the bubbles up here. There is. Okay. Oh man, I'm not gonna get bit now, huh? Sarah. Oh. Ow, oh, I lost him! No, oh, man. All right, I'm going. I'm going back, back. I like catching fish for a camera. Ah, I lost him again. Do I even have a hook on here? Oh, he bit my worm. Now, if that was a tournament, here you want to smell gold? Hey, you want to smell? Hey, buddy, smell that stinky worm. Okay. I can't see anything down there. Is there one there? Yeah, fishy, 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 fishy. Oh, come on. Don't dog me like that. Oh. Yeah, how many of you ever done them trout ponds they have here? Have you ever done that before? I was so embarrassed. I think it was uh, last year I got to take my wife and my daughter to the Sacramento show. Oh, I'm sorry, camera lady. You're down here and I'm going down there. Um, so I take her to one of those trout ponds. And... They put like a little piece of power bait on there, and you've got a rod, no reel, just some line tied to the tip. Well, I flip that power bait out there for her, and I'm holding her in my arms, because she's only like two. And she's ready to set the hook. Not really, I was. So I throw the thing out there, and I feel like I get a bite. So being the Bass Pro, I'm swinging for the fence. I've got her one arm, and I've got four feet of line tied to the end of this rod, and I'm crack! I'm like, oh. You can't set the hook like that. I broke off the first three trout, I think. And so I had to learn that I had to slow down. And I finally actually caught one for her. She was all excited. All right. Come on. Now, why I'm doing this, maybe I'll get a bite. But the, one of the cool things about these new heavy sinkers, and what I'm talking about is this new Terminator jig. This isn't it. This is, uh, it's on that other rod there. That Terminator jig. It's an ounce and an eighth. Oh, am I hung? Ah, oh, you stinker. I got a caddy. I'm so fired. Okay. Now, if you... Get, is he still on there? Oh, good. I was going to say, because if you catch him, I'm going to be upset. With this heavy sinker, now what we're do, able to do is get... You can break it off. I don't care. It's your tank is I'm able to get into these waters now on Clear Lake and Delta and penetrate back up in those tules, grass beds where these big fish are living that nobody else is, nobody else is trying to get in there. They're, fish, they're fishing all around the little outskirts. Here, how come I only got a half a worm? You still want me, she, she wants me to catch one still. Okay, how long you got, you got an hour? But what I'm trying to do with this flipping stick I'm fishing 65 pound spider wire and I'm going to try and get this ounce and an eighth jig and break through little holes and openings or create my own little openings back in these matted down toolies, the hyacinth, the millfoil, the hydrilla. And if you don't have a big rod and spider wire, don't even bother throwing it. I'm telling you right now, because if you put this jig on with 20 pound test and you get bit, more than likely, when you go to set the hook, you're going to have so much stretch and flex in your line 
you're not going to be able to penetrate that hook in that fish. And if you do penetrate the hook, and he's wrapped all up in that junk up in that shoreline, you can't get him out. So you have to have make sure you got spider wire, a heavy action rod. But that's one of the new baits coming out for the Clear Lake and Delta. Those are guys that like to flip, to get back in the heaviest jungle stuff you can find where a lot of these big fish tend to migrate in the early part of the year, even during the summertime. It could be 9,900 degrees out. These fish are buried up in that grass. Reason being, it offers a lot of shade, cooler water, plus all the bait fish tends to live in the same areas because same thing, the water stays cooler. Camera lady, you're killing me. You're, I, I'm, I'm feeling pressure and I can't handle the pressure. I can. All right. So that's an ounce and an eighth Terminator jig for Clear Lake and Delta primarily. And if I don't catch one up here, is there any around again? How many have I hooked and lost? Man. Oh, I felt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. How many of you want to see me catch one? How many of you really don't even care? Well, you can leave. Because I'm trying to get to fish. That was always the hard part is <coughs> starting out, I'm going to go, I'm going to chase him down the middle there. Is when I started doing seminars on a tank, I didn't realize that nobody was listening to me. Hey, oh man. Everybody was watching the bait in the tank. Oh, I lost my weight. There, we'll see if they'll eat a wacky style floating. Oh, come and get some. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 I see him, I see him. You get it? Oh, you spite. All right, I give up. No, I don't. When everybody leaves, I'll be back over trying to catch one. All right, here, let's talk about another one. How many of you ever fish a spinnerbait? How many of you don't even bass fish? What are you doing here? Are oh, you learning? Okay. Spinner bait is one of the most tried and true baits for the last 30 years in bass fishing. From January through December, you pretty much can catch a fish on a spinner bait. How many of you fish a spinner bait that weighs a quarter ounce, a three eighths ounce, maybe a half ounce? Most of you that fish spinner baits, that's it. I was that way for a long, long time. Until about 10 years ago, no, eight, nine years ago, I started getting some spinner baits from Japan. They were three quarter ounce and one ounce spinner baits. Now there's a lot of companies over here that say they take claim to making heavy spinner baits. And most of you think, well, why would I want to throw a one ounce spinner bait? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But you have to get used to the idea that what you've always done with a spinnerbait doesn't pertain to how you're going to fish this thing a lot of times. So with Terminator, I've helped them come up with a one ounce spinnerbait. The beauty of this is, one, I like to cast far. A one ounce spinnerbait, you can cast pretty far. I don't care what the conditions are. And that's one of the cool things is, a lot of times when you're spinnerbait fishing, it tends to be better when the wind's blowing, it's overcast. You're trying to find those wind blowing shorelines because the wind's blowing the bait onto the shoreline. And most people run the opposite direction trying to find calmer water, am I right? Well, you're going the wrong way. Chase the wind. So with a spinnerbait, a quarter ounce spinnerbait, three eighths ounce spinnerbait, your accuracy casting into the wind isn't as good. Your distance isn't as good. So now with a one ounce spinnerbait, I can cast further. I can be more accurate, but I can also fish 
One, I can fish faster. Oh, you. <laughs> That's my one. Hey. If you're all, here, how many, it's not that it's working right now. How many have ever snagged up and don't know what to do? I do it all the time still. Pull your rod back like this. Load it up. Like you're loading up a bow and arrow. Grab your line in the other hand. Point the rod at it. It's a lot of times it pops free, but obviously this one isn't. So, but I'm just telling you that it is true. I get, I can probably get 75% of my snags free by doing this. Pulling the rod back, pow. What are you just caught in a, I don't know what it does, but it just, it pops a bait free, so. Can I get some help? Yeah, that's my pet stump. I, I get that's your pet stump? Bait. Yeah, well, that's my one and only one ounce spinner bait up here, so you better bring that one back. <coughs> so, back to the one ounce deal. I can cast it further, be more accurate, and I can fish it a lot faster without it rolling over because the problem with a lot of spinner baits is lighter spinner baits when you try and reel them fast on the surface they want to roll over on you so with a one ounce bait it doesn't turn on its side plus if you fish shasta oroville any of the deep water impoundments mcclure pedro Folsom, it's a great bait for slow rolling in deep water for spotted bass what i mean by slow rolling i can throw that bait let it sink down 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, and still retrieve it and be efficient in that strike zone because you are a gentleman and not a scholar. So thank you. Because typically spotted bass love to suspend on our Northern California lakes. It's a great way to fish suspended spotted bass on any of our Northern California lakes. So that's one of the perks of it. I can fish it deep and slow. I can fish it fast. I can fish it in shallow water, deep water. So those of you that have never fished a one ounce spinner bait, you don't realize how efficient they are. So something to keep in mind, one ounce baits. Now I gotta tell you about a new one. You guys gotta tie one on first. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. How many of you fish Lucky Craft baits? How many of you don't fish them because they're too expensive? Well, you need to pony up and buy some expensive money. Lucky Craft, I am fortunate to say, is a sponsor of mine, and they've been for a long time. I've been able to work with them a lot, not just Lucky Craft, everybody I work with. And that's one of the cool things now is I get to work with all these companies and develop products. For some reason, my opinion matters now where it didn't five years ago, but it does now, so. But it's cool, I'm getting to work with all these companies, create products that I believe in, and now I'm starting to hear the feedback from you, the fans, as far as how good it's working. So when I can do something like that, it's pretty cool. And with Lucky Craft, the one thing they're really cool about is they're, they're good at listening, I'll probably drop this one in, at listening to their pro staff and developing a lot of baits that are that work they're not just sales gimmicks how many bite your line with your teeth don't do it it's bad for your teeth just ask your dentist <coughs> mm. that was a good one chunky how many of you had the cold ladies so lucky craft super cool company like i said they listen to us we get to create some pretty awesome baits they are expensive there's no bones about it you're going to pay 15 bucks a pop but most people don't realize how much engineering goes into a bait they don't just create something and just slap some paint on it there's a science to everything they do on a bait now not all of them are great but some of them are really cool and this one is probably one of the coolest things i've seen for a while how many of you have seen like the live pointers the live sammies well, it's basically it's a hard lure like you've always, you know, hard crankbait lure, just like you've always seen, but they've created a way of making it to where it's got joints in the middle and it wiggles, not like your old jointed bomber long A. It's called Live Series. This new one is probably, it's the only one I got here, so I'm going to cast it out there and hang it up on the stump, just to say I snagged everything I could in here, but a lipless crankbait. Lipless crankbait is one of my absolute favorite ways 
to catch bass. How many of you have seen any of my shows that I've done for classic patterns, bass masters, and stuff like that? I've done Clear Lake and whatever. Lipless crankbaits rock. When they're on this, you can absolutely crush fish. Lipless crankbait, hard bait, it's got rattles in the middle, doesn't have a diving bill. It just runs through the water and wiggles. Typically, you can reel them pretty fast. You can reel them a little slower, bounce them off the bottom. Well, the whole live series came out with the pointers a couple years ago. And to be honest with you, I don't like the live series. Live pointers, it's not for me. Some guys do well with them, but I pretty much sold everything I got as far as live series on eBay. No, I didn't, but until this one came out. And actually, these stores aren't gonna like it much. Shh, close your ears, close your ears. You can't hear this. It's a Cabela's exclusive, but it's a, called a live LVR. And what they've done is they've taken that live technology and created it to a lipless crankbait and put a feather on the tail. Yeah, big deal. Well, the action of the bait is no different than any lipless crankbait as far as the nose of it, but you get a lot more tail action. And what I really like about it is the fact that it's compact. Most lipless crankbaits to get into a three quarter ounce size bait, you gotta have a fairly large profile lipless crankbait. This one, small profile, but it weighs three quarters of an ounce. So in Clear Lake, in the fall, or in the Delta, the pre-spawn, those fish from that five to eight foot zone, out in the middle of Frank's track, north end of Clear Lake, wherever they might be, most of the baits that I fish before, like the LV500s, and even the 100s, I got to fish super slow to get down that deep and get to where the fish live. So I've got a small compact bait now that's very heavy, that gets down real easily and stays down there, but has a lot more subtle action too, especially in the clear water. I don't know if you, many of you ever experimented with feathers. I don't know what it is, but there's times a feather makes all the difference in the world on the back of a bait. Whether it's a topwater bait like a Sammy, a popper, putting them on jerk baits. There's times where I don't, I guess it's just something, they feel like something, the little fish got something sticking out of his behind and I don't know what it causes it. But with the feather, when you stop a bait or pause a bait or whatever it might be, just that subtle swimming action adds a lot more to it. So this is one of the coolest baits that Lucky Crap I think is coming out. You know, they got a few other baits, but this is the one because I like fishing. Ooh, I felt the bump over his back. Now, when I'm fishing a lipless crankbait, typically I'm going to fish it on monofilament. Trilene sensation, 14 to 20 pound test, depending on the conditions. I'm going to fish it on a glass rod. The reason I fish it on a glass rod is because I got trouble hooks. I tend to reeling a bait fast. So when a fish comes up and slaps at it or barely gets a hook, if I have a graphite rod and I set the hook, a lot of times I can pull that hook away from the fish or the bait away from a fish, rip the hook out of his mouth easy. A soft action rod, I prefer glass. As long as you use a soft action rod, it could be graphite, glass, whatever it might be, make sure it's flexible. What that's gonna do is gonna allow you to put a lot more fish in the boat. This rod here is one I've designed for Lamber Glass. It's a SR705. It's one of those, like I was telling you about a little while ago. It's kind of cool, I get to help develop product, new stuff. In the last Bassmasters tournament at Clear Lake, I'm driving around the lake looking, and every other boat I saw fishing, somebody had one of my yellow rods. I'm like, cha-ching! No, just kidding. But it was pretty cool seeing that, you know, a lot of people believed in what it was. Now, one, here's one of the keys too for fishing around hydrilla milfoil, Clear Lake Delta. When those fish get down in that grass and it's not real you know, sparse stuff where you can fish monofilament, fishing a lipless crankbait on spider wire is so awesome. It is the coolest thing because when you throw it out there and you reel it, because spider wire has no stretch, you feel like somebody's down there just with a, you know, I don't know what they're doing. They got a jackhammer down there. The spider wire has so much sensation. You feel every little vibration of that bait. Are you kidding me? Oh, hey, camera girl. Ooh, that's good. Of course, I'll catch one on a treble hook and I'll bury a hook in my finger up here. You gotta be kidding me. That is a first, ladies and gentlemen. I have never, ever 
about to finish with a crankbait just sitting on the surface. Okay. All right, that's how you look fish right there. I'm telling you, these products are good, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Tony. No. But these are some of the cool baits. Am I going to get kicked off here? Am I going over time? What time am I supposed to be off here? I need a new pair of pliers, too. Thanks for whoever left these up here. Maybe I don't want them. They don't work. Okay. Thank you. Where's the camera when you need me? We need them. But new bait, LV, LVR. Like I said, shh, oh, it's only. What else can we talk about to you? We got anything new and cool? How many like to fish jerk baits? Oh, we got some jerk bait fishermen in here. Hottest jerk bait Lucky Crafts made in a long time. Pointer 100 was always a go to bait. The slender pointer. There's a 97, a 112, and a 127. One of the most popular, one of the most overlooked baits from Lucky Craft that people didn't know about, and still don't know about, is called a flash minnow. It's a really erratic bait, but it doesn't go deep. Pointer minnow, more subtle bait, goes deeper. Well, the cool thing is now is they've kind of taken the best of both worlds, is we've taken a flash minnow, combined it with a pointer minnow, and we've created the slender pointer. It runs a little shallower than a, than a pointer 100, but it's got a lot more action on it, and it's got three hooks. And those of you who don't think of anything about that, well, this is how technical it gets for us, is two hooks versus three hooks. When you have spotted bass, smallmouth bass, even largemouth bass coming up, and sometimes just slapping at a bait, with only two hooks, a lot of times they can miss it. But when you've got a third hook hanging in the middle, a lot of times you will tend to hook a fish. You might hook them on the outside of the head, on the back, but it allows you to hook a lot more fish and land a lot more fish. That right there is the coolest, hottest jerk bait coming out in a long time. Berkeley Gulf. How many of you like to fish crankbaits? What do the rest of you do? You're all worm draggers, aren't you? Bunch of worm draggers up in here. Oh, I see how it is. And this is one of the deals right here that uh, this is where the, the, the pro staff had a lot of input in designing these new baits. And it's called the Fat CB, a BDS 1, 2, we had the 3 before. And I'll I got to tell you, growing up in Northern California, shallow cranking really wasn't always a factor on how we fished. I have learned from fishing back east how efficient and how productive these crankbaits can be. Yeah, you probably want to see it in the water. He means you're going to make me cut the bait off, tie it on. Do you want to? Okay. All right. I'll do that. Maybe I'll catch one on this one, too. Shallow crankbait fishing to the guys back east is an art form. They take it as seriously as Aaron Martins takes drop shotting. And that's pretty freakish. Shallow crankbait for the Delta, Clear Lake, Shasta, Oroville. When these fish move up shallow from pre-spawn all the way through summer into the fall. I would say pre-spawn, you know, early part of the year, February, March, and in the fall are my favorite times. Works great in the summertime if you have wind. Same place, you're gonna throw this thing a lot of times where I would say throw that one ounce spinnerbait. The wind's blowing up on the shoreline, there's a point. You can throw this if they won't eat a spinnerbait. I'm going to have dentures by the time I'm 25, or no, I'm already past that, so uh, 45. Uh-oh, you got to hit the tank first. That's a rookie maneuver. Golly. I'm glad you're around today. I'm telling you, the last time I bass fished was a Bassmasters tournament on Clear Lake in October, so I'm rusty. Golly. You're so fired. Okay, shallow crankbaits. I almost scalped him right there. He's walking in and he had no idea what about just happened. Okay. Shallow crankbaits are going to run anywhere from one to maybe five foot deep. You can get them from tight wobbles to wide wobbles, and some of you don't even know what a wobble is. Well, it's the way the, bite, the bait will move back to forth in the water. A lot of times, 
the wider wobble in warmer water is better. As the water temperature is colder, you want a tighter wobble. This one here is a little bit wider wobble. Great for, oh, I like to say summertime when they get on the rock and stuff like that. I'm hot as a mug up here. But shallow crankbait fishing, like I said, to a lot of guys back east is an art form. A lot of guys are learning about it. Delta, they've done the speed traps, they've done all that. Nah, 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 nah. Let me get it. I should probably get a little bit of a little wine out just in case he does eat it. Um, so some of the new baits from Lucky Craft, the BDS-1, the BDS-2, there's a three, there's a four. Let me get it. Oh, just smoke it. Come on. That's not fair. Hey, I almost caught a limit up here today. Could have caught a limit. Base to keep in mind, the Clear Lakes, the Deltas, the, like I said, even the Shastas and the Oroville's, when those fish move up pre-spawn or eight in the fall, these fish get on the rock, they might get around grass. A crankbait, shallow crankbait, is a great alternative to fishing a spinnerbait. Because how many people go down a shoreline in springtime fishing a spinnerbait? Most bass fishermen. How many people go through behind them fishing a crankbait? Very few. These fish do get conditioned to see in certain styles of baits, patterns, and all that. So when you can change up a presentation, and the shallow crankbait is a great way to back up a spinnerbait and catch you some more fish on the water. I'd like to catch one more up here, so. Oh, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Oh. We got to dance after all. Perfect. Quick release. Now, if that had a tournament, I would like to oh. go. All right, that was a lot of rumble, jumble, smack, a whole lot of nothing. But I just want to get up here and talk to you guys a little bit about some new baits. I got more. We don't even have time. I know they're going to get me out of here. Um, I've got some videos from sale, uh, some, some of my flipping and pitching videos. I've got Aaron Martin's drop shot videos. If you guys are interested in any of that, if you guys want any autographs, you want to talk fish and anything, have at it. I'm going to be right down here when I'm done. I'm Skeet Race. Thank you so much for coming to the ISE show here. I had a great time.